So uh, today, I'm going to be talking about data streams with Elasticsearch. So um, before we get started, I have a question. How many people here have used Elasticsearch or plan to use it in, in the near time? Cool, that's like 60, 70 percent people. That's awesome. Um, but I do want to mention that um, the, the topic that I'll be talking about, which is um, how to build a data streams layer on Elasticsearch, is uh, generic in nature and could apply to Postgres, Mongo, other systems as well. Um, so before we get started, um, just a little background about uh, me. So uh, I'm currently the founder and CEO of AppBase, and uh, pretty much my biggest job is essentially evangelizing um, AppBase, and since we work a lot with real time, that means evangelizing the need of real time. Um, so that's, um, this is a topic that is pretty close to uh, my heart. And um, I uh, started programming um, pretty much with my interest in building games. Um, moved on to um, writing some C code, Python. Uh, there was a brief time I also dabbled with Java. Um, I regret it. <laughs> And um, then um, I think over the last uh, um, three to four years, um, have been working pretty closely with database systems. Um, and so um, my company, AppBase, um, essentially provides a hosted version of uh, real-time Elasticsearch, uh, which allows you to write any sort of interactive queries. And um, we also do a lot of open source with Elasticsearch. Um, so we have a data browser on Elasticsearch that allows you to see all the data in real time, do all the CRUD requests. We have a really good query composer. Um, and then we are most recently working on UI component libraries that allow you to build real time UIs. Um, definitely check out uh, our GitHub um, to see this. And um, let's get started. So um, the first point is, um, what is really data streams? Like, why did I pick the name data streams? Um, real time is also a pretty good name, but um, the thing with real time is it's a very, very ambiguous name. People have used it in a lot of different contexts. In uh, database world, oftentimes, uh, the marketing copies of different vendors say real time when they really mean to say that it's super fast, it does it in memory, et cetera. Um, and so, First, I would like to just show like some use cases of what data streams is that all of us are already seeing. So if you go to Twitter and if you like search for something, um, it shows you this feed of results, but it also tells you like interactively if you stay on the page that there are like 15 new results, 20 new results. So it's like a very interactive experience where you can like follow on um, to what is happening. They also do this with the trends um, as well. And then another really good example is um, kind of the ride sharing example. So Uber started it, and um, if um, you're using Uber, it has a really nice experience from the very start where it tells you that in five minutes you will get a ride to you being able to follow when the driver is coming close to you, to you being able to share your trip um, ETA with anybody who wants to see it, um, to essentially Uber um, calculating a price surge whenever there's a demand surge um, of Uber cabs. Um, so this is all, um, like all done with core real-time ideas, core um, data streams. Um, another example is um, Google Now. So Google Now uses your past preferences, your upcoming events, uh, to tell you what are some recommended things for you to be doing, what are some things you need to be doing, et cetera. So um, it's a really neat use case of machine learning, predictions, but it's built on the fact that the online data is available, and based on that online data changing, the recommendations change. Um, beyond these, um, there are all these awesome companies, um, Twitch, Slack, Facebook, that all use real time, um, pretty much. And um, the use cases in general, um, think of, um, Streams and fire hoses um, coming in from, let's say, something like Twitter, um, Internet of Things. A lot of social media analytics is driven by analyzing these streams and recommending to different um, customers 
what are ideal interactions to be making. Um, there's also monitoring systems. So Uber is a really good example of a monitoring system. Essentially, the entire idea of price surge is based on monitoring the neighborhoods to tell when the demand is surging and when it goes back to normal. Um, there's also a ton of really good use cases with analytics in general. Um, E-commerce also has some really good use cases with providing recommendations, um, price monitoring of products um, as the price changes. Um, there's also really neat use case with fraud detection. I think um, John touched on it a little bit with his um, talk. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about the use cases. And so since all these companies already do real time, um, the immediate thought is, what is the typical approach that people take today? And um, how does it work? So this is how it works. Um, you already have a database system that is storing your data. Um, in this case, let's take MongoDB. Um, you'll just um, write some middleware using Node.js, Express, and add a library that implements a real-time protocol like socket.io that runs both on the server and on the client. And essentially what it does is it connects them so that you can send messages between the server and client. Um, what ends up happening is um, you're going to write a bunch of middleware logic to communicate between the database and that socket.io library. Um, and the, the very minute you write this code, you lose all the guarantees that your database came, uh, came with. Um, and then mostly it's going to work fine, but then there are going to be edge cases as soon as you think about how to scale your application code beyond a single machine to multiple machines. Uh, the second fact is it, it cannot handle real-time um, complex scenarios. So take the Uber's case um, of price search. Um, just the fact that you have a socket.io library doesn't help you solve the price search problem. Uh, it just helps you message it to the clients that something has changed. But you don't know how to do the entire process. Um, and then uh, the third part is uh, as soon as you start thinking about um, using something like socket.io, um, you need to scale uh, the number of clients, and once you hit a certain scale, you have to think about how to maintain all the stateful connections across server crashes, restarts, failures, et cetera. Um, and so then the really big question is, um, if you cannot handle such complex scenarios, then how are Uber, Twitter, et cetera, um, doing it? Um, and so that comes to the second part. There are these streaming frameworks. Um, Storm was pretty much the first one that Twitter started. Um, since then, Spark has been doing it, but Spark's core idea is not streaming. It's just doing in-memory distributed grids. Um, Samza, uh, Beam, Flink, Kafka has a lightweight streams connector. Um, they all do this. But really, these frameworks um, all expect a lot of prerequisites from people who um, use it, and two, they don't solve the problem of the real-time protocol. So this is how it looks if your architecture is using um, these frameworks in the mix. Okay, so you still need your database layer. You cannot go away from that. Uh, and because the streaming framework doesn't handle the real-time protocol, you still have the middleware and you're still managing it yourself. Um, what the streaming frameworks do is they give you uh, ways in which to run complex processes um, in an online way. Um, but, but still, you're left on your own when it comes to connecting the servers and clients. Um, so we now have a system that has a lot of edge cases. Because there are all these different moving pieces, we need to monitor the system to make sure that nothing is going to go down. And Overall, I really don't like um, seeing so many moving pieces. So we don't have to do this. And this is where um, I'm proposing an alternative. Um, why don't we take all the good parts that the databases already have? You know, databases are incredibly good at distribution. They are like the best distributed systems. They have a very powerful querying API. We have been working on database systems for the last 30, 40 years. People rely on it like pretty much. That's, that's like the, the main point of uh, reliance. 
And why don't we bake in the real-time protocol within the database system itself so we don't need to have those middleware which could have faulty logics and which could let us to lose the guarantees that the database first came up with. Um, so that's kind of the basic idea, and, and that is what um, we do um, on AppBase.io, which is a hosted version of uh, doing real-time with Elasticsearch. Um, but what I'm going to introduce um, over the rest of the talk is how can you build one yourself if you wanted to? Um, and then uh, we'll have a fun demo with something we already built. So um, I'll first walk through Elasticsearch, uh, just a quick primer, uh, and then talk about why Elasticsearch in particular is a better system or why we picked it over others to do this. Um, so the first fact is um, Elasticsearch is built on top of something called Lucene. Lucene is an extremely fast search library it has been in active development for at least the last 20 years. Um, all search engines, pretty much all, um, use Lucene as the base and then build up on top of it. So what Elasticsearch does is it takes Lucene and adds distribution. So now you have a system that is highly available, has a really good search API, and through its evolution, Elasticsearch has also built a really good aggregations API um, and also has had some really good features that make it as a good proxy for a database system. Um, and so, yeah, it can scale to many nodes, it's highly available. Um, we have run production clusters with 30, 40, 50 nodes, no, no issues. And um, overall, the use cases are in the analytics. Um, it's, it's a document-oriented store, pretty similar to Mongo. Um, it's open source with an Apache 2 license, so that's pretty good as well. Um, and there's this really neat feature in Elasticsearch called percolation. How many people here have used percolation before? There's a few. So, like, about a lot of people use Elasticsearch, but very few people know about percolation. And what percolation does is it allows you to search in reverse. Um, so the very main idea of a database system is you index a set of documents. A client makes a query against those documents, and the server returns the matching results. This is pretty much the pr premise. Um, but what percolation does is it allows you to index queries instead of indexing documents. And now instead of a client running queries against um, the indexed documents, you run documents against the indexed queries. This is how it looks um, visually. Um, so imagine there being like a stream of documents that is coming into the database. This could be coming in from like anywhere, like IoT devices, mobile devices, um, and Elasticsearch is pretty good with indexing. Um, and there you have an index of queries, and each time a document hits the DB, you get the matching queries that match the document that just got indexed versus um, the other way. Um, and this can work anywhere. Uh, it, it can work for search, it can work for analytics, aggregations. There are a few edge cases, um, but it works in principle very well. Um, and so this is how, um, just to give a better perspective, this is how Percolator works. Um, if you're not able to see it, essentially what is happening is this is a REST call to index a query. Um, if you notice, there's a dot percolator in the um, endpoint, and that tells Elasticsearch that this is not a normal document, it is a query being indexed. Um, and now what happens is um, there is an endpoint to um, send a document and run it against the index of percolators. Um, and the response looks something like this. So in, in this case, we only had one query registered, and we gave it an ID of one. And we can see here that uh, it found a match in this particular index with an ID of one. Um, so that is percolator, and that provides a really good foundation to building real time, because essentially, if you think about it, when you go to Twitter, 
what is happening is there is a query that is running interactively. And as new tweets are coming in, uh, it needs to just know if those tweets match your search query. And if they do, then just show those tweets. Um, so Percolator already does a lot of heavy lifting here. And all that is missing now is how do we add the real-time protocol to make it all work, to make the connection to the client so they can all see the streams. Um, so essentially what we need to do is map the idea of queries, documents, the topology that Elasticsearch uses to how real-time protocol libraries like WebSockets um, work. And um, what we do is essentially treat each query as an active channel. So when, let's say, you go to Twitter and you type in something, that creates a query, and it's an active channel that is kept open. Now, any time your DB sees an index request that matches, you're going to send out an update to the connected users that made that query. Uh, so the first idea is keeping queries alive and treating them as subscriptions. The protocols don't really matter. We could support HTTP streaming, long polling, web sockets. There are already very good libraries to do that. Um, and then the really important part is that this works as is with the Elasticsearch APIs. You don't have to translate anything. Use the same queries, everything just works. Um, and so um, the key idea is that um, we treat, we index everything, queries and documents. Each thing that we index is mapped to a channel um, and then um, we just keep the same model um, that Elasticsearch has without changing anything. Um, so this is the really fun part. Um, we have been working on this for the last few months. Um, and essentially, since we have existed as a hosted service, we got a lot of people asking us, um, how can we run this ourselves? How can we run it behind a firewall? How can we run it? I already have an Elasticsearch cluster. I just need the real-time part. Um, how can we do that? And so um, essentially, um, I just pulled this um, image up yesterday. Um, it's live on Docker Hub. You can check it out at the URL. Or if you do a Docker pull with this um, repository, you will be able to get it. And I'll show a live demo about how it works. Um, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. so this is how it is architected. Um, the really uh, amazing part is um, it's built on top of Nginx. Nginx is used by, um, I would say, more than 50% of the really good websites. And it's super, super scalable. Um, and we have essentially added the entire real-time logic into Nginx itself. Um, and so this sits in front of your Elasticsearch cluster. Your cluster could be running anywhere. Um, and then it intercepts which queries need to be interactive, keeps those connections open, manages those connections, and uh, the queries that are not interactive directly hit Elasticsearch. So let's say if you start using this, but you never make a change to your code, um, nothing would happen. Your cluster would just keep working as it is. But if you now add some of the queries um, and make them interactive, then um, it, it's going to yeah, do some magic. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to show the demo. So um, let's see. Okay, so um, we're just going to first see um, nothing is running on the machine. And uh, first we'll spin up an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, I'll just spin up one node. Um, so. So um, yeah, this, this is pretty much it. Uh, our node should be up and running in a moment. Um, but since I'm using Docker on a Mac, um, it, it's, and it, Docker by default uses a bridge network, it's going to assign it an IP in its own namespace that is not on the local host. So we'll just first see um, what is the IP that Docker assigns. And 
we can see it is um, this thing right here. And now when we run our um, streams proxy, all we need to do is tell it where the Elasticsearch IP is and it will start the streams. Okay, um, so let's just make sure that Elasticsearch is in fact up and running. All right, so we got Elasticsearch running um, on port 9200. And now what we are going to do, I believe the fonts are pretty small. Let's just make it bigger. Okay, so now what we are going to do is run um, the streams. I already have it pulled up, so I'm, I'm just going to do a Docker run. So we'll just clear this up. run hyphen D, give it a name. Okay, and I already have um, this code, um, auto-completion. So um, what we are doing is um, just setting for the demo SSL mode to be off. We don't want the basic authentication. Um, and we are running the version 0 0.2. Uh, and we specify uh, in the environment variable that our Elasticsearch is on that particular IP. Um, Okay, that's it. And uh, now we have the real-time um, streams up and running. And um, what we'll do is we'll test um, and see how it works. So we will assign a variable streams to the local host. And since streams itself runs on port 80 and 443, um, we are just going to make a request um, on port 80. So let's put a document into um, Elasticsearch. And so now we are making a request, and I'll also make this bigger so it's easier to see. Okay. So um, we are just making a request that says, um, and it's not visible. Yeah, that says hello app base. And um, I just get back a response saying that it was successful and it just created a new document. Um, and it also gives me an ID of the document, which is the super long string because it auto-generated. And so what I'm going to do um, on the other end is just first fetch this document to see if it actually works. So this is our local host. The index is blog. And it is inside a type called post. And we need to use this ID. So I'm going to copy it and paste it. OK, yeah. I just have to make sure that the streams variable is also set here. And now we can fetch the document that we just indexed. So streams is running as a proxy, but it didn't affect the operation, the output, any of that at all. Uh, but what we are going to do now is um, run a query. And just to make it simpler for me, I'll just um, get the query from an example I have. Uh, and by the way, this is all on the readme of Docker Hub. Um, so you can see it all. Um, OK, so this is our um, stream query. Um, the only difference it has is it has this query parameter called stream equals true at the end of the query endpoint. Um, and we are matching anything that has um, the content app base in it. And um, if you notice, the connection is kept alive. It didn't like terminate itself. Um, and now, I'm going to post another document um, which has the word hello app base. And that did not work, but that is because 
we had it running on a different, huh. Okay, that's, um, so we will run the query again. That looks good. Um, we're looking in post. No, that was just uh, index. Okay, yeah, this is the query. And, oh, I think I know I didn't press enter. Okay, yeah. So um, now the stream is working. Um, and we can see that it updates every time there's a new document. And, oh, because I changed the word app base, and I shouldn't do that. That's what it is matching against. So, um, yeah, so um, this is pretty much the idea. Um, you can run any query. Elasticsearch supports maybe like 100 endpoints. Any of those you run, this will work against it. Um, the really, um, uh, there's actually some more awesome stuff. Um, so we will also um, create an index and assign it a TTL and just see um, if that index exists within the TTL and if it exists after it. So, um, here, I, I will create a new index and give it about 15 seconds to live. And on the other hand, I'll just create a timer for 15 seconds. And if we query this uh, right now, I'm not sure if I would be still within 15 seconds. Maybe not. It doesn't exist because I already passed the time. Um, but I'll create another one. And now if I index, uh, if I get the index, it exists. Um, but if I would, again, make the get in about um, five or so seconds, it, it wouldn't exist. Um, so this is a pretty cool TTL feature because one of the ideas with um, streams is uh, you might sometimes be working with sensitive data that you don't want to be stored all the time. You want it to expire after a certain time. Um, so if I do this now, it returns a 404. Um, that's perfect. Um, so now we go back to the presentation. And um, the really neat parts are it's uh, performant because of Nginx. Um, it can now work anywhere because it's built with Docker. Um, you can run it behind a firewall on data centers, anywhere you like. And it uses all the good parts of the existing data layer of Elasticsearch. We did not reinvent the wheel at all. And um, some of the features are it has a really nifty time to live feature, which is very good when working with sensitive data. Um, optionally, it has a mode where the data never hits Elasticsearch. It is just streamed. So you never need to store anything at all. Um, and that is also very good when you're working with a lot of log data that is not important. You only care about the results. Um, and then it also has interval and frequency-based queries. So um, instead of it telling you every time there's a match, you can tell it that only tell me after 10 seconds and up to 50 times if there is a match. So it will aggregate all the matches in those 10 seconds and tell you them all together. This is a really powerful design pattern because it's really clean. What, what is happening here is you're indexing the data, you are storing the data optionally, and then you're streaming this indexed data to create actions. These actions could be anything, and sometimes these actions might, might lead to another index request. Um, but the really neat part is, um, yeah, so you, you could, in theory, using an action which is sending an email, which is calling another REST API, which is maybe running an AWS Lambda function, um, and that function returns a result which gets indexed. So it's a very um, declarative way of doing things versus an imperative way where you have this middleware which is talking this with these five different things. Anything could go wrong anytime. Um, and so uh, we also ran some benchmarks to, make, to see like, how it would perform in terms of the overhead, 
when there was just Elasticsearch and now when there was this proxy. Um, this is how it looks. We used a data set uh, called GeoNames, uh, which has about 8 million location documents. Um, and we used a benchmarking framework called ES Rally, which is the official benchmarking framework that Elasticsearch uses. And um, we did this tests on um, AWS using M3.2x large nodes. And we started with three nodes, six nodes, nine nodes, and did this test with uh, three reputations to make sure we were not observing variance. And um, what we saw was um, there was a less than 1% indexing overhead. So essentially, while this proxy sat in front of Elasticsearch, you would get the almost same performance if you did not have this. Um, we also ran this on a different data set, which just had the geolocation points versus documents. Um, and that allowed us to also see very similar results. Um, we also tried to benchmark the latency, because one of the key ideas with streaming is how quickly can you broadcast a message to all the subscribed clients? To, to give you an idea, like Discuss is a very popular um, service for comments. And at peak times, they have about 45,000 connected clients. Um, so we were able to broadcast pretty um, easily to 10,000 clients, making sure that each broadcast receive, was received by all the clients within one second. Um, we still need to do more benchmarks uh, to be able to plot something here. But this is a really, really good number. And this is all happening with a single proxy, no scaling needed. Uh, and since it is built on Elasticsearch, um, uh, sorry, since it's built on Nginx, and Nginx can scale really well, um, if you have a high memory node, um, it, it can easily handle even up to 100,000 um, connected clients. Um, we did observe about 20% CPU load at indexing time, but the really neat part is you don't need this to be running on the same host as Elasticsearch, although you could. It could be running on a completely different host machine. Uh, and it, it could be connecting to the Elasticsearch nodes. Um, and then also, if you do need to, like 100,000 clients is a lot, but if you do need to, you're one of those companies, then you could still scale these nodes as well. Um, that's possible. Um, so we are going to be working on adding webhooks so that the part about actions uh, that I mentioned earlier can be done in a much easier way so let's say if you want to send an email via SendGrid or send a Slack notification, it's real easy to do that. And then we'll also be adding some aggregations um, so that not only can queries be streamed, but also aggregations that have state within them. Um, so that is the talk, um, data streams with Elasticsearch. Um, I would love to take any questions. Cool, awesome. So um, I think this is the last talk. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here. And I definitely want you to try this out um, and let us know. Um, it's, uh, open, it's an open Docker image. We'll, we are going to be keeping it free for a long time um, to see what happens. And then um, hopefully this helps you um, get ideas about how to do this on your database system. Thank you.